So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Aperio Teaching and Learning Call. Today is Wednesday, September the 6th. My name is Matt Burgess. I'm with the University of Virginia, and along with Neil Caden, I'll be leading this call. We have a fairly full agenda today, so I think we'll dive right in and start with some project updates and announcements. For those of you who haven't already signed in on the Etherpad, I encourage you to do that, and the link to the Etherpad is at the top of our chat for this call. And Neil has already very helpfully pasted some great notes about project updates and announcements onto the Etherpad. So Neil, go ahead and take it away and catch us up on some of this stuff. Sure. Uh, and I'll let others chime in as well. So um, especially Wilma with Sakai Docs and Virtual Conference, but I thought I just want to make sure they're all all the information's here. So there is some some blog posts recently, just FYI, including some of the things that we're talking about um, in these announcements. So you might be interested in that. There's a Sakai triage meeting as normally on Monday, but we moved it to today at 2 p.m. because uh, Monday was a holiday in the U.S., Labor Day. There's a Sakai accessibility meeting today at 4 p.m. for those interested in jumping on that call. Just thought I'd mention that. Sakai 12 is branched, so we hit a really huge milestone. Uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, really important in order to get 12 out. We first had to get it branched and that means we got a snapshot in time and we'll start identifying bugs, which we've already started doing and getting those fixed. So I won't get into a lot of detail right now, but just as uh, important FYI and, um, and we're going to have a Sakai 12 features lightning talk on Monday at 9 a.m., which we will record. And we have uh, Dr. Chuck on that, and we'll have Diego from Unicon, and we'll have folks from Longsight on there, and we'll have uh, NYU folks on there talking about their contribution. So it's a way to get an orientation of a lot of the major new features um, in 12, which should help both the community to understand kind of the excitement around the new release as well as for our QA effort. And we do need QA resources, wink, wink. Um, we have a QA test fest on Thursdays. Um, we're structuring it a little bit differently. We're going to have a 9.30 start for people who want to get oriented to Sakai uh, QA process, like an onboarding orientation. And then starting at 10, we'll have our normal uh, QA. And if you come on there and we'll just, based on what your needs are, uh, in terms of areas of expertise you have in Sakai, your level of time that you have available, all those kinds of things, you know, we'll be happy to point you in the right direction of how you can contribute. Um, Sakai documentation resources are needed. So that's another one. I'll let Wilma talk to that in a second. And a Sakai docs right along this Friday. I'll also let Wilma chime in there after just kind of going through this list really quickly. Um, Sakai Eventbrite registration is open, and so there's a link there for our yearly uh, Sakai camp in Orlando. Um, so tickets are free, but obviously travel in a hotel and so forth is is uh, at your own cost. And there's a Sakai camp light on October 25th after the All Things Open conference, which is in Raleigh, North Carolina, my neck of the woods. And so no registration, but if you're planning to attend, please let me know. It looks like we're going to have... Um, uh, of course, while we'll folks from Duke, uh, Dr. Chuck's going to be there, probably have some long site, one or two people. Um, I'll be there. Uh, Durham Tech, uh, looks like UNC Chapel Hill, Wake Forest. I'm not sure, Matt, if you're going to be able to come, but that would be really cool. Um, so that's, uh, that's going to be like a one day thing, very informal, but we usually, when we get together, we have a lot of fun and come up with new ideas. So, uh, we just saw that as an opportunity since some of us were, uh, attending the all things open conference, which is a pretty cool conference by the way. Um, and it's a kind of virtual conference, which I'll also let Wilma speak to any pieces there she'd like to, uh, highlight, but we have the call for proposals open and many other things happening. So I'm wondering Wilma, if you'd like to take a couple of minutes to talk about, um, the Sakai docs and to talk about the virtual conference. Sure. Well, you kind of already mentioned most of what I was going to say, but that's all right. Um, it never hurts to repeat stuff. So um, the Sakai Docs Ride Along is going to be at 10 a.m. this Friday. And basically that's um, 
it's a session for anybody who's maybe interested in learning more about the process for creating the documentation in Sakai, um, or if you're interested in pitching in to help update some of the docs for version 12. We really, really need help authors. So if you're at all interested and you think you can spare a little bit of time to update some articles, um, you know, please try to go. It basically, the, the session on um, Friday is going to be kind of walking through the process of updating an actual document. So I'll be showing exactly what I do when I go in and, um, and work on some of these um, documents to update them for the new version. So you'll get a, a sense of what's involved um, as far as, as actually authoring some of the help. Um, now that's just updating existing documentation. We also have a few new features in Sakai 12. Those have not been documented yet. And so um, if anybody is interested, um, you know, we won't be covering that on Friday, but if you're interested in documenting some of the new features, please do let me know. Um, because again, we need people to help in all phases of the documentation effort. So um, also the virtual conference, just wanted to remind people that the, the call for proposals is open. And um, it looks like somebody already pasted in the link for the uh, call for proposals page, but there's a submit your proposal link there. And um, the form is already accepting um, submissions. So it's open through September 29th. You've got the rest of this month essentially to get your proposals in. And we really encourage you to um, think about, you know, uh, doing a presentation on something you're doing locally, or maybe if it's a presentation you've given to a different audience, um, you might want to tweak it a little bit for the general audience. The virtual conference is a very faculty friendly event. We try to really uh, draw in people to talk about best practices and pedagogy. So it doesn't have to be necessarily cutting edge Sakai tools, but um, how you're using them effectively in, in, in your class. And so if you know somebody on campus that's doing something really innovative or really engaging with their Sakai course, please encourage them to uh, put in a proposal and again we really want to encourage a lot more faculty um, participation in the event um, and let's see I think those are all my announcements for right now unless there's any questions all right thank you Neil and thank you Wilma for those announcements Neil Caden is asking me in the chat if I'm going to share my screen am I supposed to share my screen Neil well it's helpful I mean uh, maybe somebody else will but it's helpful in terms of the recording because then there's something visual to look at there oh gotcha okay I'm sorry about that Neil well I will do that um, once I get control back because I think I'm about to hand things over to Louisa and I think that Louisa has something that she would like to show to us. So, Louisa, I think you're going to talk to us for the next couple of minutes about syllabus and lessons. And so I'm going to hand presenter privileges over to you. Um, thank you, Matt. All right. So um, it came out from our last discussion about a syllabus tool and the new features in lessons, you know, how we are going to combine these two or just use lessons. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of demos we did. Uh, so I open the screen. Start. Oh, wanted me to use Java. Okay, hold on. Uh, be right there. Okay, it's a starting. Um, okay, do you guys see my screen now? Oh, not yet. Okay, so run Java. All right, how about now? Now we see you, Louisa. Good? Yep. Okay, very good. So uh, this is our uh, Sakai instance. I'm going in as Mary Marist. Go to a demo site. You can see there. Uh, this page is the first page of uh, a course site. Uh, we use the lessons tool. Uh, so if I switch to the student view, you can see that we use the uh, various features in lessons, make it pretty, 
and you can see this area we link the syllabus uh, basically this is what most the faculty does uh, they just link a document there and that's it and to um, diversify a little bit you can make it two columns and have a quick poll there so basically this is the introduction page you can also link the number of uh, weekly pages here. Now, here's another sample. It's a little bit simpler, but uh, we also use the sections and the columns to break up a little bit. Uh, so on the top, you have the welcome, instructors, uh, video, by the way, this is Corey Nicoletti uh, and her famous dog. And so uh, you also have a syllabus here. Uh, to improve on the syllabus uh, discussion, uh, we have a link uh, to the um, quick poll so you can see uh, how many students actually read it. It's kind of like a contract. Now, go to the next sample. Uh, so this is another format. You can break down the weekly pages by topics. So basically give faculty several choices. They can see how they can design these lessons pages. Um, so another discussion about the syllabus is that in the syllabus, you can break down into several sections, right? And you can have uh, class information, uh, course schedule, grading uh, policies, uh, class support links, etc. So in lessons, you can have this type of uh, sections and it's a accordion design and you can just uh, retract them, expand them and see loads of content. So if the faculty wants to make an effort to put all the syllabus in these different sections, that's definitely doable. Uh, so I think this is a great new feature in lessons. All right, so uh, let me just show you very quickly. I dabbled a little bit with uh, Sakai 12 this morning. Unfortunately, the CK editor didn't work, uh, so I cannot show you some fancy text. So this is just a very simple. Uh, I just make this also student view. So you can see that, oh, the student view takes a little bit while. Okay, so under the student view, you can see on the very top, that's also the syllabus. And when the student confirmed they have read it, then this is a new feature. You can embed a calendar here. And these are all the events due, assignments due. And this is a new announcement. Uh, you can have a number of announcements showed up here. I. Um, uh, set it up to show the first, uh, the latest, the five assignments, uh, announcements. And also you can show the latest forum posts. Uh, I set it up to show the, uh, the latest five forum posts. And you can have weekly pages on the left, right? So there are many different layout design you can do. So this is the simplest the one I came out with this morning. All right, that's it. Very quick demo. Okay, so now I'm going back and stop sharing the screen. So questions, I assume I have a question. Sure. Um, so are you using it, is it like something that you use institution-wide to use lessons in place of syllabus? And if so, do you have any sort of, you know, structure for doing that or just something that just here and there instructors are using um, uh, lessons instead? Uh, we started to pushing it out this semester uh, because we are uh, seeing that there is very little use of the overview page and there is a complaint from faculty that they cannot uh, customize the overview page um, and the lessons are getting stronger now. And we tested it out with one of our schools, uh, School of Professional Programs, and modified their school specific template, to see how they respond to it. Uh, so far, they uh, like the lessons template very much. And they also did, as you said, Neil, uh, the questions about the overview page. Uh, they raised the question too. So they've been using it for a month now. We haven't. Uh, heard anything too bad about it. Uh, so maybe um, when Sakai 12 is in, we will push out this new type of template. 
Uh, so, uh, and we also have a few people using it in their own courses. You know, the faculty uh, themselves voluntarily they chose this template, uh, use lessons as the first page of their class, and also uh, our workshops and a couple of uh, uh, projects side they adopted this uh, template. Um, I think it's pretty good for projects and the workshops. Yeah. Um, um, so David has a question. So we already using 11. Uh, we've been, uh, we upgraded to 11 last year. Yeah. So we have lessons for about two years now. Uh, I mean, the new lessons, I mean, uh, two, two and a half years. Yeah. Maletti was long gone. So we had a little bit of uh, issues with importing content from Maleti to lessons. Uh, but now I think most of the contents are in lessons. I haven't heard anything too bad about it. Yeah, so people seem to be accepting the fact Maleti is gone. Lessons are here to stay. Yeah. Um, Oh, by pushing that out, uh, suggesting or requiring, uh, we are suggesting right now. Um, so in the workshops, uh, in our tutorials, and uh, uh, some of our discussion, face-to-face -face discussions, uh, we suggest this, suggesting. Uh, we're not replacing syllabus. Uh, syllabus tool is still there. It's just the overview page. Yes, I agree. There's a lot of uh, flexibility in lessons. Yep. That's it. That's awesome, Louisa. Thank you so much for taking just a couple of minutes to walk us through some of the things that you all are doing. I certainly agree with some of the things that you and Dave have said about the flexibility of lessons, which is something that we definitely try to impress on our faculty at UVA who've started to use it a little more. So. I think all these options are great, and I'm looking forward to seeing more faculty adopt them going forward. And Dave also had a comment in the chat that you know using those uh, customizable, collapsible drop downs for the lesson areas is very similar to what you already have in the syllabus tool out of the box. And I agree that is possibly a way to help transition faculty into using some of those features and in lessons instead. All right, so at this point, I'm going to hand presenter privileges over to the fabulous Josh Wilson from Longsight, who is going to talk to us a little bit more about some group management options in Sakai. So I have now made you a presenter, Josh, so take it away. And Josh, if you're talking, I at least can't hear you. So you might want to check your microphone settings. Just to make sure this isn't a problem on my end, can anybody else hear Josh? If you could just let us know in the chat or come on the mic, that'd be great. Okay, it's like we still can't hear you. And Josh has posted in the chat he had a power issue at just the wrong moment, which I totally understand. He's also posted a link to a preview in the chat. And Josh, I've posted the audio by phone information in the chat just in case that might be helpful to you.
Hi, all. Is this any better? Hey, Josh. We can hear you. Welcome. There we go. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, you know, it's all fun and games until someone pulls a plug out of the wall. <clears throat> so thanks for, uh, for, for bearing with me there. So um, this is a continuation of a conversation we had at our, uh, at our last call last month. Um, so the, uh, the, the question was, what's the way forward for, uh, for group management and specifically group locking behaviors? So let me, let me back up a step. So I would, Sam Ottenhoff, who is uh, our uh, CTO here at, at Longsite, asked me to, if I could dive into this and see if I could help, uh, help the community come up with a way forward. So I figured, what the heck, I'm the new guy at Longsite. For those of you who haven't met me yet, I'm the new vice president for operations and planning. I have, uh, I'm in my seventh week at Longsite. It's it's been uh, it's been a fun seven weeks, and I've been enjoying getting to know you folks. I was previously the associate CIO for academic technology at Brandeis University in Massachusetts, which is still where I'm located. So, I'm uh, I'm well I'm well ensconced in the open source world, but uh, but definitely coming up to speed in the Sakai world, and it's been a lot of fun working with you guys. So that's uh, that's a little bit of background here. So being the new guy, Sam asked me to dive into this, and I thought I would. Uh, my take on this particular question, what is the way forward for, uh, for group management and specifically group locking, was to figure out what are our pedagogical use cases? What do our, our faculty and our students need from us? Uh, what's the behavior that Sakai ought to perform in order to be able to have the academic outcomes that instructors need and that students need. So the best group to think about that is this particular group. So the last time we talked, we uh, I, I proposed the notion that maybe we take a user-centered approach to this and maybe we gather use cases. So it was a it was a process question the last time around. And the outcome of that, so that conversation was, yes, let's be user-centered. Yes, let's develop use cases. Yes, let's take a longer time slot at a future meeting and, and figure out what some of those use cases might be. So that's our current state. Um, does anyone have any thoughts that they want to add at this point before I, I propose uh, one of two different ways forward from here? Um. The, the one thing, hi, this is Tiffany Stull. Um, the one think thing that. that I was concerned about um, with the proposed group locking was the removal of features, uh, not just from assignments, but from other tools like Samago uh, that currently handle uh, groups better than assignments. Um, so for instance, Samago does not have as quite as much of a problem uh, with the groups as assignments does, and locking could severely impair its uh, its performance behavior. Right, absolutely. And uh, um, Tiffany had a lot to say in the in the Sakai ticket, in the, in the uh, sorry, the, the Jira ticket that, that informed this a little bit. So for those of you who are looking at the uh, the discussion starter I posted, the, the Jira is linked from there, but I will shove it in the, uh, the chat as well, and also the shared notes. So, I mean, I think, you know, yes to that, and there are, that begs the question of uh, whether we approach this from a more fundamental group management perspective. Uh, channeling uh, Earl Neitzel at, uh, at Longsite, he would argue for better logic around group management in the kernel. So a group management service that multiple tools could work from, so that we're not trying to solve the problem in assignments and then have to solve it again in, in Samago and wonder, you know, how the different tools interact and what the different behaviors might be. So, but I think the the truth is that we we probably ought to be thinking about that in the context of user-centeredness anyway. You know, so if we can figure out what the various use cases are that are that we need to address, you know, then we can figure out what the behavior is that ought to address those use cases and then how to do that fundamentally so it's it is uh, Sakai wide as opposed to being strictly tool wide. Anyway, that's that's my thought. Uh, does that seem like like a reasonable approach? Do do others have thoughts they want to share at this point? Yeah, I, I think that's a good uh, way to go for sure. Um, to have a, a better uh, group service that can be applied uh, more globally to the different tools and have consistent behavior. 
Do others have thoughts they want to toss in at this point before we, we jump on to the next thing? So it seems to me that there are two ways forward at this point. Um, one is uh, one is for us to develop a plan together here this morning to go out and consult with our faculty and our students uh, about use cases. Uh, that's going to need to happen one way or another, uh, but we could develop a plan and then uh, go off and implement that plan. Another, another option would be to develop those use cases here. I think that's probably uh, not as good an option. A third way would be a, a bit of a hybrid model where we think about some use cases here by way of pump priming to get ourselves thinking and then go out and then make a plan to go out and talk to our faculty and our students to validate those use cases and uh, and add new ones. So let me let me take the we develop use cases here question, you know, proposal off the table because I think that uh, this needs to be user centered and we've agreed about that. Uh, what is the what's the sentiment in the group regarding whether we strictly develop a plan here this morning or whether we do some pump priming and then develop a plan? Uh, who would who would prefer a plan uh, plan development solely as opposed to pump priming and and plan development? Maybe if you can uh, if you can toss a a plus one in the comments if you if you feel like you want to do some pump priming that would be great. Dave, Evelyn prefers pump priming. Are there others that are in a pump priming mode? We have a plus one from Matt Burgess. This is, uh, although we can end up talking to death, I know. Um, well, so we should, we should probably time box the pump priming to, to Terry's point. So, uh, to that end, Matt, what, is, um, what does my timeline look like? When are we stopping this conversation and uh, moving on to the uh, discuss and schedule future meeting themes and topics? So, I Josh, we usually take, you know, maybe five minutes or so at the end of the call just to kind of wrap things up. We have meetings already booked for two of our next three meetings, so we don't need to brainstorm any of those for the most part and we can do a lot of that offline so really you've got about 25 minutes or so at this point does that sound good yep that sounds great that's really helpful um, I want to be mindful of that so why don't I propose this um, it seems like we're not getting a lot of uh, um, opposition to pump priming um, so what if we were to take 10 minutes and talk about some use cases and then when those 10 minutes are up, we can turn to developing a plan for, for gathering user input. So, you know, Dave raises the point about how quickly we need to address this. I mean, I think the, you know, in some ways, the answer is not quickly at all. You know, maybe we ought to defer this for a while. But on the other hand, my sense is that the longer we defer, the less likely we are to actually have this solved in time for the Sakai 13 branching. So getting an early start and making a plan for gathering user user experience data and then coming back to evaluate that, that's probably going to take a while. So an early start would be a good thing. Uh, so that's that's my thinking on this. All right, so it's, it's 10.32. Um, I'm going to set myself a uh, timer here on my end um, for uh, for 10 minutes. So let's, uh, let's pop on over to the group locking discussion Google Doc. And uh, I, threw, uh, I threw a couple of use cases in here, but I, I wonder if we could take a look at these and validate these and see which other ones we can come up with in the next 10 minutes by way of pump priming. So the two I tossed in here, and uh, you know, this is not a comprehensive list, this was my own personal pump priming, was uh, number one, the idea of manually created groups. So these would be, project teams or assignment teams within a course. So uh, this would be a situation in which uh, a faculty member creates groups of students so that they can either do some, some work together or, or complete an assignment together and submit it together. So 
the bullets underneath this use case are a couple of uh, problems that I drew from the uh, from the Jira. You know, things like um, a student submits an assignment for a group and then switches to another group. A student submits an assignment for a group and then drops the class. Um, a faculty member might switch the group uh, for a, a follow-on group assignment, and there may be others. So, you know, my sense is for this use case, we probably ought to better define it. Um, we probably ought to define the uh, the behavior that we would like to see. You know, what what ought Sakai to do in this in this situation, um, and then then we can address some of the problems. I think that the challenge has been that we have spent a lot of our time spinning in in uh, the, sp the space of the specific problems with, with Sakai's current behavior, as opposed to thinking about what that new behavior ought to be. So, with that said, um, I wonder what your what your thoughts are. Um, why don't you know? Why don't we t take this moment and let's let's define the different permutations for what uh, when manually created groups could happen? I mean, I've tossed out project teams, assignment teams. Um, so what are what, what are some others? And I'll just uh, I'll just scribe in the Google Doc as we go. Uh, this I think. Is, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead, Tiffany, and then Charles? Why don't you jump in right after that? Okay. Um, I think it's also fairly common to use groups uh, as ways of sharing contact information um, among students, like their email addresses, uh, with with the other students. Um, and I don't know if that would be considered a project team too. It might be. So Tiffany, tell me tell me a story here. Um, so, and make you know let's let's make this a little bit concrete. So, the faculty member creates a group. Students share contact information to what end? Just to get to know one another for something for some other purpose. Um, usually it would be for projects. Uh, no, the roster tool does not help with this in the case that uh, the roster tool is hidden from students because um, they're to protect instance. student information. Tiffany, that's only in our instance. Oh, everybody okay. Everybody does it that way. So it could okay. be. Although it, it strikes me that this, this could be a use case in more places than just UVA. Um, you know, there there may be other institutions that also hide the roster tool, but it sounds like this is a this this use case is a uh, a student focused roster. You know, or yeah. a, or a student centered roster. Yeah, basically, like a, a just a a way for students to share their information, meet up for whatever reason. You know, project teams, study groups, stuff like that. So this is um, this is something. This is a function that a project team or an assignment team could handle, or it could be separate from projects and assignments. Yeah, either way, I think. Yeah, you know, it could be a study group type of thing. Mm -hmm. There's uh, also joinable groups, um, depending on whether or not the instructor is creating them, or if they're joinable, where students can join or leave a group um, based on how it's set up. So, Wilma, what's the what, what's the use case that you're putting forth here? It's similar to the one Tiffany was describing, where it might be a study group or, you know, some other um, student-oriented group. But instead of the instructor creating the groups and putting the students in them, it's a joinable group in Sakai where students can actually add and leave groups um, by their own volition. One example of implementation of that might be book topic. So pick a book, read it, and write a report. Let's separate this out. Um, what 
we also have an instructor who's used joinable groups um, to allow his students to create web pages together, uh, you know, like student lesson pages. So the students join a group um, and then they have access to a group targeted lesson page that they can then edit with their uh, teammates. Although that sounds like not a student's joinable group, but a, a, a faculty created group, unless it's a situation in which the faculty member says, hey, you guys can do this if you want to. Um, I leave it up to you. Is that what you're describing? No, uh, the students choose which group they're going to participate in, and then they have access to the corresponding lesson page. So um, they're joinable groups. Uh, the students have maybe four or five topics, and they say, I want to work on this topic, so they join that group. And at that point, they can then access the group lesson page and contribute to it. Okay. Just so this a small clarification. The joinable groups are still created by the instructor. It's just created as a joinable group. Um, so the students don't actually make the groups, but if the instructor allows it to be joinable, then students can add or leave the group. All right. So we've got groups assigned by faculty members. We've got uh, groups created by faculty, but joinable by students. Right? Yes, that's correct. And, and whether or not the student can leave the group is also part of the settings that the faculty selects. Okay. So that's an option to allow them to, to freely pass from group to group, um, in which case the student could, you know, him or herself, uh, be removed from a group uh, by their own action. So this, so this is pretty interesting. So in some ways, um, so this is true of either the fact that the groups assigned by faculty or the groups that are created by faculty but joinable by students. So it could be that students can switch between project or, or assignment teams um, at, the, at the faculty's discretion when they, as, as they design the course. So uh, there could be teams that are assigned and teams that are switched up by assignment. Uh, there could be teams that are joinable and students are allowed to switch in between, uh, you know, according to whatever rules are set up in the course. Right. Am I am I understanding this properly? Yes. So there, there are um, a number of ways that students can be removed from or, or moved among groups and faculty can also um, delete groups. So uh, that, that's one of the major uh, causes of, um, of lost submissions is the faculty member deletes a group that kills its internal uh, group ID and then anything that was previously assigned to that group is now lost. So let me um, see. Um, um, Okay, so I'm we so I'm defining two use case categories at this point. So we've got groups that are assigned and created by faculty. Faculty can switch group membership mid-course. We've got groups that are created by faculty but joinable by students. And students, uh, depending upon how the faculty sets it up, can switch group membership. Um, you know, those those two might overlap a little bit more, but for for simplicity and, and pump priming right now. Well, actually, so let, let me ask this question. I mean, so can we, hey, there's 10 minutes. Um, I wanna, so let me not ask the question I was gonna ask. Uh, let, me, let, let me make sure that I capture what, uh, what Tiffany just said, which is, uh, it's about group deletion. One of the things that I wonder about is whether there are use cases that we can determine where groups ought to be deleted from a course. Because I know that you know that does cause the problem that Tiffany described. You know, do we is do we want to make this possible? So I think there are reasons why you might want to delete groups. You know, you don't always use groups for assignments or assessments. You know, you could use a group in a project site. Um, you know, so they they might not 
need to be to remain. Um, and in some cases, you might want to delete them if you have a very large um, project site where people are assigned to teams. Um, maybe those teams are not, you know, specified to particular items in the uh, in the site. Uh, or they, they create something together, but then it's visible to everybody. Um, in that case, there could be perfectly good reasons to delete the group. Hi, this is Charles now. And actually, the, the use case that I was going to bring up was actually related to ongoing project sites where um, the one in particular that, that I'm thinking of is actually one that's done for um, compliance with uh, fraternities and sororities and they have to submit things occasionally but the people that do the submission change from year to year as the the officers in the individual fraternities and sororities change so if the if as a group they have submitted something and then that group can't be changed to update with the new people in a new semester That's great. Um, I mean, this is kind of interesting because we're, we're segueing into, you know, from course sites to project sites. And yeah, there's there's overlap, but uh, we started off thinking about stuff within a course. And now we're moving to uses for student organizations. I'm, I'm taking your use case and writing it more broadly, thinking about student organizations where leadership and membership changes. Um, this is Adam at PC. At our institution, we also have a unique use case for group-based assignments where our enrollment services office has a project site where they do course articulation via group assignments. So they will post a foreign course description from a foreign institution and then ask people within the institution to articulate course equivalents. Uh, and the membership of the group submission and people who need to review change, but it's a way of um, approximating workflow within a project site. And so the what what population at your institution would take part in this process? Is that faculty? Chairs and faculty. Okay. So um, Am I getting this right? So mapping courses at other institutions to, to Providence College courses? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's let's pause there and let's um, let's turn to the question of how we develop a plan to um, to capture a sufficient number of use cases to inform our next steps. And also, I didn't, I didn't really structure the gathering of these use cases. You know, it could very well be that we want to assign a structure to make it easier for ourselves as well. So, um, the the first question is, you know, do do folks have capacity at your institutions to talk with faculty and students about these questions? I, re I realize this this involves like you know being a joiner and signing up for things and doing more work. Um, yeah, that's right, Trisha. I agree with you. There are crickets. Um, I mean, I don't want to put something out there that people don't have time to do. Um, you know, the the truth is that we we might approach this by saying, all right, uh, let's develop a plan that we could implement during the fall semester. Uh, so between now and December, people, you know, over. The coming 12 to 15 weeks, whatever your whatever's left in your semester, um, you know, people might confer with a handful of faculty and students um, to develop and, and validate use cases, but only if we think that it's reasonable to do. Um, and I, I I do get that this is hard and takes time, so I 
I, per, I participated for a decade in the, the team that runs the, the MISO survey, which measures the effectiveness of IT and library institutions, IT and library organizations in higher ed. Uh, so we have tested the instrument with faculty and students from time to time. So I've done focus groups, I've done individual interviews. It is, it is a huge pain in the neck and a huge suck of my time, but it, it was necessary. The question is, does this rise to that level? Um, is it is it important enough for us to take the time to be user centered about this? It, uh, Josh, this is Trisha. I'm going to say that um, I think it is useful. Um, to do so, but I'm also wondering, sort of as an aside, it, I know you're taking notes on these different use cases. I wonder if you could, could put those somewhere and, and give the rest of us access to it so we can think about them a little bit more, maybe add to them. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I mean, currently you guys all have access to this document, but I think that probably some sort of a matrix uh, would, would make a bit more sense. You know, what's what's the use case? Who's the affected population? Um, you know, what's the, what's the behavior that we want to see? You know, that kind of thing. So I'd, I would be glad to take these and put them into a matrix that people can kick around. Uh, but that doesn't, that in and of itself doesn't provide us with a way forward. Okay. I, I've got the link to the document now. Thanks. You've already put it in there. I didn't see it before. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. I also want to be mindful of time. I mean, you know, Matt, it's 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 ten fifty. You know, what's the? I'm I'm new to this community. I'm new to this group. Um, what are what are your thoughts? You know, conveners, Matt and Trisha, and I forget who the third person is um, about you know the right way to come to a decision about taking action. Because if we're going to do this right, uh, at least several, if not many, people need to participate in uh, this kind of, in, in this work. Sure, absolutely, Josh. I think that's definitely true. I think that one thing that often happens on these calls is that you know the things that are presented here, the initiatives that are begun here, often then continue offline. Uh, you know, we continue these discussions through the Sakai mailing list, through the Aperio TNL list. You know, people can get involved there. We can share documents. You know, we can share work there. Um, so, you know, this meeting can also be just the foundation, the springboard um, for later work. And even if you know, we don't have a critical mass of people that sign up in this meeting, we can often have people who you know, think about it, talk about it amongst their groups at their own institutions, and then come back offline or in a way and say, yeah, we're ready to do this, and this is something that we want to make a priority. Okay. Well, that's fine. So wh why don't we, why don't I then commit to putting forth uh, this document and a related matrix of use cases that people can add to? And if, you know, we we can have the conversation about whether we're capturing the right data points about the use cases, whether we ought to capture more or whether it's too granular. You know, that can be something that we comment on in the document. People can add to it as they go. And when there's there's appetite for returning to this, you know, we can we can have a follow on conversation. And I'm, I'm happy to, you know, to help with that. The one thing I don't have access to, I mean, this is my challenge, right, is I no longer have direct access to faculty and students. I know exactly who at Brandeis I would have consulted about this, um, you know. But being alongside, it's a it's a very it's a different role. So, uh, you know, the consultation has to happen at your institutions. I, I can't help with that directly. And that's definitely something that I know you know many of us at our institutions are certainly interested in diving into because you know I know. And I know Tiffany and Tricia feel the same way that you know we're interested in making groups more effective uh, for people at our institution. You know we have had some use cases where groups aren't working as effectively as they could. And I know one thing that we could do 
um, at our institution, at least to get things started, would be just to review the questions and comments that we've had from faculty in particular about groups in the past, you know, that we have ready access to that information and we can at least do a cursory scan of that stuff and say, okay, what kinds of questions have people asked in the past and how have things worked or not worked? Um, you know, so that's something that we can do in addition to, you know, reaching out to some of our other faculty and students. Sounds great. All right, so I will um, I'll put forth some documents for, for this group, uh, a matrix, and I'll, a cleaned up version of this discussion starter, and uh, we can take it from there. That sounds great, Josh. Thanks so much for uh, taking some leadership on this, because I do think this is something that's really important, and it's great to kind of dive into it and think about it, not just about you know how this works in Sakai or online, but also how this works generally pedagogically, which is something that Dave has raised, you know, in the chat, um, just reaching out to faculty and asking them, you know, how have you been using groups or even the contrary, you know, how have groups not been working well for you? How have they been deficient for you? Um, you know, so those are things uh, that we definitely want to think about. I notice Adam has also asked a question in the chat. Uh, you know, was group locking instituted previously in assignments as an approach to fix a problem, and would it be more appropriate to change assignments than to fix the group locking? I think that's a great question, Adam. I know that's something uh, that one of our developers, David Hutchins at UVA, has been asking lately because he has been looking at just the way that assignment stores information, and that's a conversation that has been going on in the larger Sakai community as well. And that's something that we might want to continue to think about is, you know, in these cases where groups might not be performing as well as we would like, is that an issue with the way that the groups are constructed? Is that a way, um, an issue with the way that the tool is constructed or both? You know, so those are things that we want to think about uh, as well along the way. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, it, it's my sense that really good use cases will help us shine a light on that question and determine whether we want to pursue it that way. Yeah, I think that sounds great. Absolutely, Josh. All right. Well, thank you, gang, for taking the time. I appreciate it. Oh, this has been great. Um, this has been a great pair of presentations, a lot of great things to think about as we start to dive into the meat of the semester. So just a couple of quick notes on some upcoming meetings. So our next meeting is two weeks from today on September the 20th, and that meeting will be a presentation of an Atlas Award-winning course. Uh, Denise Comer from Duke University is going to take us through some aspects of her course composing the internship experience, social media, and digital discourse. So it will be great to have a winner here to talk to us a little bit about how she's been using Sakai on the ground, you know, to get some more of these really great use cases to see how people are actually using and benefiting from the system, you know, something that Josh has been diving into on this call today. Uh, we do have an opening on October the 4th, so we have an opening right now on Wednesday, October the 4th. So if you're interested in a topic or if you have a suggested topic, uh, please feel free to send me or Neil or Tricia an email because we do have that one opening right now. And then on October the 18th, Foster from Western University and Jolie Tingen from Duke University are going to give us a presentation on creating an interface guide for Sakai. So for those of you who we're at Open Aperio or who have been starting to work on this project with Sean and Joe Lee. You guys may be familiar with this, but for those of you who haven't seen this project before or would like a refresher on it, this is a really, really important project that's going to help us take the design for Sakai to another level. And so I really encourage you guys to join us for that discussion, uh, whether you've seen some of their work on this project already or not. So we have some great things coming up. We do still have one opening, so if you have thoughts about that or a possible project, feel free uh, to shoot us an email. Otherwise, we may draft you and you may get an ominous email that you've been drafted. So we uh, look forward to all of those things uh, coming up. And I noticed Louisa has also put uh, her email in the chat. Louisa, did you have uh, some particular things? Oh, I see your comment earlier in the chat that Atlas is recruiting com committee members, uh, committee members for choosing our Atlas Award winners. And let Louisa know if you join, and her email address is right there 
in the chat. All right, so thank you all so much for a wonderful meeting. We'll see you right here uh, in two weeks uh, for another exciting discussion. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week. Thanks very much.